A mobs. Now we're live. So, <clears throat> that's the second time in a row that uh, YouTube has done that to me, where, uh, in this case, I was watching it, where I've, I've hit the go live button, navigated away from that window just to put out all the various social media posts, and then um, it didn't go live while I was navigated away from that window. That's probably not how it's supposed to behave, but at least uh, it was more like 15 seconds this time instead of 15 minutes. So thanks everybody for showing up. Uh, I actually have talk egg points tonight in a new innovation. So um, mostly they're not about the topic, which we will just extemporaneously ramble about, but uh, they are about various things that I want to make sure I don't forget to mention. So, we are drinking um, Glen Livet Caribbean Reserve. I want to call it Caribbean Cask because uh, the Balvenie stuff is called Caribbean Cask. Um, to be honest about it, uh, this is not as good as the Balvenie Caribbean Cask. So, or, for that matter, it's not as good as the Glen Morangy, uh, whatever their rum cask finished um, expression is. I don't think, anyway. But it's a cool idea. And it's not bad. It's just not as good as the Belveni crew. Belveni anything, really. Belveni's one of my favorites, so. The uh, John Longshore, the trumpets have to do with the name of a book. Uh, can't remember the author's name off the top of my head, but it's a relatively famous book about the Battle of the Bulge. So, let's first of all... Uh, going through the talking points one by one so that I don't forget any of this stuff. Mention that Connections Online, uh, even as we speak, is going on. Um, you can get information about that over at the Armchair Dragoons website. Um, so do check that out. <clears throat> it's not really a conference that you go to play games at. Um, it's a lot more like the Origins War College, where it's a series of seminars that talk about both historical topics and wargaming topics and which involve both hobby presenters and professional wargame presenters that do wargaming for various branches of various militaries, which do not all include the U.S. military, in, at least in this case. So I may end up opening the window behind me, um, or I may not. Ooh, that's not good. Counter is delaminating. Clip around it usually is, is sufficient in the case of GMT counters. So uh, the I am involved behind the scenes of the Connections Conference. Um, the two events that I uh, helped on the back end with today were a, um, a distributed wargaming seminar, which was like four different presenters talking about different technologies that you can use to wargame things remotely, uh, more or less in a professional context. But, but I got something out of that conference. Um, and then, uh, the first event, which I, uh, also helped facilitate as well. Second event in the, in the day. So the, the whole thing is going on Charles B. McDonald, Robert Moffat. Thank you very much. Um, the whole thing is going on until Wednesday, but then there are extended events extending as far as Friday, and I will be participating in at least one of those later events, but I have, you know, stuff going on this week too, so... We cannot, um, we cannot dedicate full, full time to it. So we will be doing this here tonight, and then we will be live with Dan on the No Enemies Here channel. Actually, I think that's on my channel this week, on, on Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. Eastern. We're going to talk about collecting, wargame collecting, which we've talked about here. So we'll have Dan's input on it as well, and maybe maybe some other people we'll see. But that stream has been a lot of fun. We'll talk about the rest of the upcoming stuff uh, later on in the show. So uh, <clears throat> several people have asked uh, about the next sale wave. And i got to tell you, uh, it's a tremendous amount of work to put that together and sell the amount of stuff, which was not by any means a backbreaking amount of stuff. I mean, there weren't that many individual pieces uh, that we sold last time. And, and still, it was it consumed... 15 hours a day for about three days 
um, and none of which involved was like making the video or anything like that. That went relatively quickly. Although, thinking about it, the video did have to be edited, so that probably took quite a while as well. As always, there have been some errors. So there's, and I apologize to those people. There's some somebody whose email just got lost. And I ended up selling the game to somebody else, even though I had told them they had dibs, and I felt bad about that. So sorry about that. And then there's somebody with an ambiguous address, and it keeps circulating. It, it has already been returned to me once, and it is probably going to be returned to me again. So we'll see if we can manage to unscrew that. So it's it's you know it's not. It's not error free. It's never error free. I'm only human and all that. So, um, and it's a huge amount of work. That said, the notional plan is to start working on the next sale wave uh, this coming weekend, which will be when Connections is over with, um, and I can dedicate some time to it. So, hopefully, what that means is that the actual video will go live during the week next week. Um, and that there will be, and, and I'll pick an early day in the week. I'll probably have it go live on Tuesday so that I have the Wednesday, Thursday, Friday to get everything packed up and shipped out and all that. Uh, I think the vast majority of people who bought stuff were happy, and certainly I think the prices were more than fair, um, but it was a big pain in the dumper. So um, we're, we're, there's a little bit of foot dragging, and, and I'm using connections as an excuse because I am dedicating a decent amount of hours per day to that at this point. So, Carl, thanks for stopping by amid the... the uh, and, I, Carl, I, I want you to run that 1985 Under Iron Sky thing. If you uh, end up doing that, um, I will happily hop in and uh, watch that. So I wanted to get that out. So that's, that's that. Uh, there will be an RPG announcement at some point. Um, things are still maturing. Um, the, there's likely to be more than one RPG announcement, but only one of which will be something I will be running. So, uh, I do not promise a particular schedule for that. I'm still, still kind of putting things together on that front. And we are still putting things together. Um, I should mention, and I'm not sure if I mentioned this, um, last week or the week before for that matter um that the impact of the counter clipping stream has been so great thanks to all of you who stop by every week um that we now have and this is something that i've been asked for you know why why can't you do this in an eu friendly time slot because this is not an eu friendly time slot um i'm happy to report that multiple people in europe are actually doing counter clipping streams right now maybe not weekly but ricardo massini who's uh who's a great guy and who's a link to whose channel is in the video description is doing counter clipping streams now there's good news and bad news the good news is that it's in an eu friendly time slot the bad news is it's in italian so if you uh speak italian or you just want to hear the the beautiful sound of spoken italian you could tune into ricardo's stream um, and more, uh, I will, I will draw your attention to more of counterclipping streams as they are, uh, dropped, uh, drawn to my attention. Uh, let me also mention, even though I hate doing this, um, because it seems to have an effect last week, um, that if you would like to support your favorite content creators, there are a number of ways to do that. The, the easiest, lowest impact way to do that is to subscribe, like the videos, comment on the videos, hang out in the chats, all those kinds of things. Sharing those things around on social media is always super helpful as well. Um, I share, I tend to share, unless I forget, which does happen, um, on Facebook and Twitter and usually not elsewhere um i've been forgetting to do it on the new consum world social site for example and it, it, on facebook there's a million different groups to share into and i, I can't put them I, i'm not gonna bomb them all that's just, I, I don't want to do that so um so i st usually stick with my page and maybe the war games page and that's it um, and I'll also mention that if you'd like to support Ard Wolf Slayer specifically, there are links to the Patreon and merch store in the video description. The merch is, is cool, and once again, I have forgotten to have the coffee cup sitting here so I can show you what the coffee cup looks like. I'm very happy with the coffee cup, the coffee mugs. So, 
So I'd also like to uh, to give a shout out to uh, Todd, aka Wardrobe, aka Itinerant Hobbyist, who has sent me his copy of Barbarossa Kiev de Rostov, which I was looking for. Um, and actually, I, I think he bought it <laughs> out from under me when I was like trying to contact the, the person on BGG that was selling it. So, uh, but he has sent it to me, and now I have all but one of those games. Um, and I will wait for the reprint of Army Group Center whenever it shows up. So that is all. I have the upcoming list, which I left several things off of, but we'll just have to go through those at the appropriate time, So, which we'll do much, much later in the show. So uh, once again, I'd like to thank everybody who has stopped by uh, to give specific shout-outs. John Longshore, Stigler, Brian Patterson, Purple Norseman, Krusty Captain, Kilroy, Robert Moffat, Matt Taylor, Carl Crater, who I've also uh, already mentioned, and Mr. David Thompson. Um, David has sort of a pseudo series going on. I don't want to use pseudo because it makes it, it sounds a little. So there's a difference between, I, I think, a series like, for example, the Gamers, whatever series you want to pick, OCS, SCS, Civil War Brigade series, whatever, which has a, a discrete series rule book that applies to every game in the series, um, and a series like David's series, um, of solitary games and or for that matter Mark Simonich's operational games operational World War II games all of which have <coughs> a lot of shared DNA but there's no there's no shared rule book right there's a lot of little differences in those games and if you're familiar with one of them you're probably not going to be surprised by the new one um, but at the same time you can't get away with not reading the rule book either um, something like uh, a, a an OCS game, you know, we don't have to read the rule book, right? There is a rule book that we have already read. Um, we just have to read the game specific rules. Um, there are, as I see it, advantages uh, to and disadvantages to it. On on the one hand, um, it eases the learning curve, right? Because you do not have to learn a new system for every game, even to the extent that one has to in, say, the Simonich operational series. So, um, you know, there's not, like, big new features in that. I mean, the, the major mechanical features are shared. By the way, I believe I have decided to uh, Ziploc bag a time for trumpets, even though I'm putting them in a tray at this exact moment. Just because I believe it will, um, well, it'll enable me to fit the whole thing in the box. Let me put it that way. And I'm just going to organize it by high-level formations, and that's it. So, uh, upsides of series games. I mean, the, the, the obvious one is the obvious one, where you don't have to learn separate game systems for each new game. I mean learning the series lets you play a lot of different games optimally right so there are series you know games with series rules where there's only two or three games uh, one example would be bcs which has three games in the series so you can get the bulge or you can get two different things two different situations in north africa that you could play out using bcs at this moment um on the other hand, OCS, at least if you have the games, which, you know, is not a small thing necessarily because most of them are out of print and those that are out of print tend to go for fat money. Um, we're Ziploc baggy. And I'll make some kind of fancy cards or labels or something for these bags, but I'm not doing that tonight. At some point, we will have a video about how to make the bags and the labels and the tray labels and all that other stuff. Uh, I promise that that will happen at some point, but but not today. So, Brett, thanks for stopping by. I know you've been uh, had your hands full today as well. Um, so, an OCS, for example, lets, lets us play a lot of different types of situations, right? A lot of them are East Front, which is kind of where, you know, OCS made its name, but... Um, not all of them are. There are two different North Africa ones. Well, and an additional med two two in the med actually if in the in the two different Sicily games, I suppose. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, 
Excuse ah, poop. I think I put some planes in there. Well, screw it. It's too late now. Um, we'll figure it out later. There's nothing missing. Um, so on the other hand, OCS also highlights one of the downsides of series rules in that eventually a series is going to hit something that is somewhat outside the box of what it was designed to handle. Um, the best example of this in OCS's case, I think, now I haven't played them all, bear that in mind, so you know, people will tell you different things, is Beyond the Rhine, which bluntly does not work in the first several so the, the first the fact is that the first three to four turns are going to set the they're going to determine a lot of the course of the rest of the game and the first three or four turns are the turns that do not work there is no reason to act as the allies historically acted uh, in beyond the rhine in fact if you do it is dumb um and that and that's a problem um and i think the game works fine um but because it fails the historicity test so early um that's problematic because um you're going to end up with something that doesn't historically look like that campaign did um except viewed from a, a quite a distance viewed from quite a distance yeah you will end up at the end of in may 1945 or however long it runs you will end up look with something that looks historical but but all of the different movements within that symphony are going to be different um and i think that i think that's problematic for beyond the rhyme and and that should not be understood too mean that I'm saying I will never play Beyond the Rhine again because I have every intention of playing Beyond the Rhine again. Um, but the the fact is that there is a given competent German play. There is uh, the Allies have very restricted options at the very beginning. Now some some errata changes have occurred since the game's publication that may have a significant impact on that, and that's why I want to play it again. Um, but, you know, is this a case of trying to fit the square peg in the round hole, right? Where you're, you're trying to use this East Front series, which generally works and functions very well on the East Front, um, into this West Front topic, where a lot of the situations are very different. The, uh, the air war situation, for example, on the West Front is very different from the way it was on the East Front. To the extent that many game designs dealing with world, you know, West Front World War II in that time frame just are designed to say the Germans have no air power. <laughs> um, that's you know the or or something very close to that. I mean, the Goss games basically do that. Even Atlantic Wall, the Allies have like thirty or forty or fifty or something like that air points to deal to work with. I think the Germans have six. Um, and they can be lost permanently. So over the course of that very long campaign. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm mixed. I have mixed feelings about. And, and I say this as somebody who is very heavily invested in series games. Um, I made a choice to say a lot of what I am doing in, as a war gamer is series based because... It lowers the mental bandwidth and financial bandwidth to some extent, too, as long as you get the stuff when it's new, um, uh, required to, to, to operate in those spheres, right? So, I mean, I'm good. I'm, I don't have to worry about what the new Labatt game costs, for example. Um, I'm very happy. I mean, so the, the, the other thing is that... There's probably a difference between a, a game that is going to be big and complicated, saving the mental bandwidth by going with a set of series rules, and a game that is, by its nature, going to be quite simple, saving that mental bandwidth by going with series rules. And um, uh, the examples that spring to mind, the, Carl Crater mentions the, the Mighty Endeavor, and I think that's a very good example. Um, it is a game that does very well by its very simple system. Um, it is a game I like a lot, and yet uh, the, the, the counterexample of a game that's super, super complicated 
it would be again the Goss Atlantic Wall, the Decision Games Atlantic Wall, which has oh about an eighty-page series rule book, and then about another eighty-page or sixty-page or something like that game-specific rule book. Um, and I'm not sure that you're saving much mental bandwidth in that case. And that's a game I've played and which I like a lot. And I like a lot of what that system does. I'm not convinced that it couldn't be done with less overhead, but you know, I still do like a lot of what that system does. Uh, Kyle, Kyle Reese mentions that series rules may help a system be refined and perfected over time, and I agree with that completely. Um, and once again, we're going to probably use this repeatedly as, a, as an example, but again, this is just because I play it a lot, and, and it gets played a lot here. Um, it is OCS. That that rule book, that OCS rule book, it's not a particularly, it's not super overwhelmingly complicated game, but it's not simple either, right? It's a 64, 68 page rule book. And that rule book is polished to a very high sheen. And we're not talking about a game system that's, I mean, I, I was ragging on my buddy at the OCS game the other day about fid fiddly little rules, because there are tons of fiddly little rules in there. Um, and yet, almost always the answer that you're looking for is in the rule book. And, and almost always, the answer that you're looking for is not that hard to find in the rule book. Um, and I'm not even using the index as the reason why, although it is nice that it has an index. And if the guy that did the index is, is uh, Dave, how you doing? Hope you're doing well. <laughs> Um, so, and it's a, it's a, it's a great thing that it has an index, right? Let's just check. Yeah, more orange guys for some reason. I may end up with, uh, I may end up with the more gray guys. Jeez. Um, I may end up with a tray, one counter tray for the markers and baggies for the the, the high-level formations. Well, I mean, so... I, I flip side, I was watching the uh, Matt Caffrey's presentation actually till right before while I was stuffing meatloaf into my face uh, just before the stream. And it's a very good presentation. There's a lot of really interesting things. And he does a lot of talking about um, the roots of wargaming and historical games like the game of Ur and stuff like that. But he also talked a, a whole lot about um, stuff like the von Reichswitz Kriegspiel and why uh, wargaming in Germany went south. For example, mostly thanks to Kaiser Wilhelm. So, I mean, I'm not scared of big rule books, but um, the, I mean, the, the hardest part, as as Mr. Tom, just David Thompson, who is I think still here, can attest, the hardest part of the game design is to keep it simple. I, I mean. Maybe that's not the hardest part for some people, but it was the hardest. So let's let's be clear about this. I have never designed a war game, and I do not really have the hankering to design war games. I do sometimes get the hankering to redesign counters, um, like in the case with Pacific War, the Victory Games Civil War. But the, both of those are getting new versions, so I you know who cares. Um, but. Um, I have designed RPGs, and it's it's always easy to say, okay, I want the game to handle this particular thing. Um, let's put a rule in for that, and you have it. You put it your your, your own mechanic, and and RPGs, at least an RPG D and D is like famous for this, right? There's a different mechanic for every little thing, um, at least in the old versions of D and D. Um, there there was a different, or at least. Yeah, that's pretty much still true, actually. Uh, there's no, like, universal uh, mechanism or anything like that. Um, and it's very difficult to then step back from that and say, Let, let's abstract this just a little bit. And, and to do it well, right, you can always just say, well, no, we'll just handle this specific thing as part of a standard resolution system. And maybe maybe that doesn't make sense, because that resolution system doesn't work for what you're trying to do. 
Um, maybe it needs another layer, like the Shadowrun Magic System, for example, which has several more layers on top of what the standard Shadowrun Resolution uh, system does. Grumpy Gamer says, latest OCS series rules have a misprint which makes the index completely useless. Well, there's also OCS Depot, which has all those that stuff online, so you can always print your, your own. Um, and also, I am fairly sure that if you had like a page pages transposed or something like that, which which is something that does happen from time to time. Um uh, I'm sure Multiman would fix that if you call him up and ask. <laughs> Stegler is becoming insulted now because of the counterclipping, which which offends him, which offends his delicate sensibilities. So that's okay. Um... And David also mentions that writing the rules is more difficult to write succinctly than uh, as as was the case in the questions in the events that I was uh, managing earlier today. It's like, please keep the questions brief because I have a 200 character limit for what I can put on the screen. And yet, if we get whole paragraphs, please consider the blah, 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 such and such and so and so. Blah, 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 blah. And, and by the way, how do you feel about this then happening after this thing and conditionally? Blah, 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 blah. Like, ugh, okay. So, I mean, everybody says, and, and I, I'm going to, again, point to RPGs as the, the counterexample here. Everybody says games, you, you want games to be simple, and yet all the popular games are complicated. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's it, it, all, all of the really enduringly popular RPGs are, in fact, fairly complicated. A lot of the enduringly popular um War games are really complicated, like ASL, right? That's still like the biggest war game, the biggest single war game. I mean, Panzer Blitz is really simple, but who's playing Panzer Blitz now? But it's, it, Panzer Blitz now is, is is pretty much a novelty item. Um, that said, it was it was very popular for a while. Um, I'd also say that war games and RPGs have different fundamental goals. Also, there's no real need for all of the players of an RPG to understand the rules. Um, it is sufficient for the game master to understand the rules, and that's that. That's sufficient. Um, and in fact, that's a part of the reason why I think D and D has gotten along with being so freaking complicated for so long is because um, it wasn't necessary to learn the whole game. I mean, character creation has almost no choices in it, right? So you can just Make a character, roll the dice, pick a class, pick a race, buy equipment. That's pretty much all the choices that you you know historically classically have in in D and D character creation, um, and everything else is pretty much something that the game master will handle, right? And and there are war games that run like that, like the creature spiels and the command post exercises and stuff. a lot of the facilitated things like the things that are being discussed at the Connections Conference right now. Patchwork Pictures, at some point, we are going to have a full video treatment. I don't, Again, I'm not promising any specific date here. A full video treatment of Rollmaster. Um, and that date may be approaching uh, because it is a... the complexity of... It, it, it de does depend on which version of Rollmaster you are talking about. Uh, but the complexity of Rollmaster is mostly an illusion. Um, there are a large number of tables, but they're mostly all the same two kinds of tables, right? There's a maneuver table, which is one table. There are attack tables, which is 20-some uh, tables. And there are critical tables, which are eh, another dozen or so tables. Um... All the attack tables work the same. All the critical tables work the same, and the maneuver table is just the one table. Now, this is this is Rollmaster Second Edition. So I will explain the whole Rollmaster. I I could sit here and say I'm going to run Rollmaster here live in this chat right now if I were pre prepared to do such a thing. And here is all you need to know in order to be a player in that game. 
when I ask you to make a roll, you're going to roll percentile dice. You're going to add your skill bonus, which will be a percentile skill bonus, and you'll add any or subtract any modifiers that I tell you about. And then you will look that result up on a table, either the maneuver table, which you will be given, or an attack table, which you would also be given. That's the whole game. And, and I mean, there's some stuff about, you know, you have hit points, right? And there's some stuff that we'd have to explain as we go, like, okay, we have a critical result against you that results in bleeding. Here's how you do that. But everything, that's that's like, that's all I need to tell you. Um, that said, some Rollmaster character generation is relatively involved. It's not that complicated in 2nd Edition or Rollmaster Classic. But um, in Rollmaster Standard System and Rollmaster Fantasy Role Playing, which are pretty much the same game, it becomes more complicated and considerably more time consuming. So, all right, let's put the planes where they go. And do a few markers here. So let me uh, catch up on the chat. Civilized Gamers Clip. I completely agree, Purple Norseman. You are a gentleman and a scholar. Uh, Avalon Hill Classic Series had all kinds of eras and wars using the same CRT. None of the games are that realistic, but they're all simple. Yeah, that's pretty a pretty accurate statement. Um, they pretty much did all use the same CRT. Um, the, I would call... The simulation value of almost all of those games, depending on exactly which ones we decide to put into that category, pretty low, um, to be honest. Somebody mentioned GURPS, and I Patrick Pictures mentioned GURPS, and I forget what the context was. Uh, possibly in the context of having a separate little rule for everything. However, um, GURPS is another one of those things where the complexity of the game rules is a bit of an illusion because you can play using GURPS Lite, which is like a 16 or 30 page little paperback folio book that has the guts of the system and everything else that you, you could just add things like additional advantages and disadvantages and skills and that's it. I mean, you could run out of that and it would work fine. Um, that Then again, if you want a special rule for every little thing, GURPS has a special rule for every little thing. And it is a source... Uh, I, As somebody that has run GURPS a couple of times, but never seriously, and, and has played GURPS a couple of times, but never for any... Again, never for any extended period. Um, I am disappointed that Steve Jackson Games doesn't really seem to care much about GURPS anymore. Um... I'm not convinced they're going to continue to care, although they do at the moment, about the fantasy trip, which is the Steve Jackson-designed metagaming title that Steve Jackson re relatively recently got the rights back to, um, and which is an obvious predecessor of GURPS. There's a lot of the same ideas and core concepts behind the fantasy trip ended up in GURPS. Uh, I, I haven't looked closely enough at the... I've never played the Fantasy Trip back in the day. I've never owned a Fantasy Trip product. I've looked at the current box, which is an attractive footlocker-sized box. Um, but um, the... I don't... I don't see the appeal in the Fantasy Trip at this point. But but I, I might not just not be seeing it, because I haven't looked closely enough at it. That's very plausible. Um... I will also mention that a lot of the GURPS books are are super... And I'm talking... Now we're going back to 3rd edition, which is still like the definitive source books on a lot of those topics, right? The GURPS book on ancient Rome is a great book. There's a GURPS book on the Napoleonic era, for example. What other RPG has done that, unless it was a specialized Napoleonic RPG, which I think does exist, and I'm not even counting... Um, oh, that card game from Clash of Arms. Uh... Uh, 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 the name of which I can't remember that now. Clearly, I need to drink more. Um, I think GURPS is a, is a quite adaptable system, but you do end up losing a lot of flavor if mechanical flavor is important to you. And it is tends to, it does tend to be attractive for me. Um, there's also other things. I mean, that, that acronym started as a joke, and they just never came up with anything better. So that's what they stuck with. Um, 
There was, of course, a whole period where... Here's something funny. Why am I wearing headphones? I am not listening to anything right now, and my ears are sweating. Um, because I was listening to the presentation before the stream, so... Uh, Gerf's Box of Rebellion. I mean, in terms of like treatment of historical topics from in a role-playing game context, GURPS is impossible to beat. Um, there are specific games that do specific topics as well or better than GURPS, but a lot of times they try to put like a fantasy spin on it. So there's a <coughs> Roman Republic game, alternate history Roman game called Fulminata, which is a pretty neat game, but it's not just a historical game. It's it's got like fantasy elements and a magic system. Um, Legion of Honor, John, thank you, uh, is the game I am talking about. Uh, so, but uh, it also, there's another game called on the samurai era of Japan uh, called Sengoku, which I think is a better presentation of that material than GURPS Samurai or GURPS Japan. Uh, but GURPS Japan is still pretty good. And there's also an, there's also two other fairly decent. Well, there's one other fairly decent competitor there, which would be the Lee Gold Land of the Rising Sun for Chivalry and Sorcery, which is coming back, by the way, for the new edition of Chivalry and Sorcery, and Lee Gold is writing it, which is awesome. Um, so I'm real interested in seeing that. Um, I don't think Bushido was a very good game. Um, I don't think it had a particularly good treatment of the historical material. Um, this would be the, the FGU Bushido. Um, GURPS Traveler, I was getting to that. So there, there was a point at which, you know, the answer for Traveler that was being published was GURPS Traveler. And I, I have everything ever released for GURPS Traveler, including the stand-ups and the deck plans and everything, and the little booklets on the worlds. Um, a lot of that material is really, really high quality. However, um, GURPS has by nature some things that i do not like about it for traveler what one is the deterministic character creation system you have a pool in gurps you have a pool of points and you build your character with these points there are certainly people that like that rather than rolling dice for character creation there are people who absolutely will balk and that's a hard stop uh at um die, die rolling in character creation um, Stigler, we will get back to that. Um, for me, that's not the case. I think the, the, the emergent story in the Traveler, besides their Traveler Warrior games, uh, the emergent story in the Traveler character creation system, I think, makes it completely worth it, and GURPS lacks that. You have to put, you can get that, but you have to put that in yourself every single time by hand. GURPS is the generic universal role-playing system. Um... Also, and this is going to sound like a nitpick, and, and it is to some extent, but it is a nitpick that makes me really dislike using GURPS for um, Traveler. Um, there's compatibility issues between the GURPS Traveler stuff and the regular Traveler stuff because the systems are completely different. Um, so, for example, the GURPS Traveler material uses the GURPS tech levels rather than the Traveler tech levels, and they're not the same. Um, Traveler tech levels top out at 15, 16. GURPS tech levels top out at 12 or 13. Um, so when you start getting a track, uh, GURPS tech level 14, you're talking about some truly magical shit. Um, so you've got to like massage that. Imperial measurements. GURPS uses imperial measurements for everything, and I, I think that feels wrong in a sci-fi game to say, Captain, they're 26,000 miles away. It, that wouldn't happen, <laughs> right? We would be using the metric system at that point. It just feels wrong. Um, you, it, it even it feels more wrong than making up your own fictional units like Battlestar Galactica did. The original Battlestar Galactica, they didn't really use that in the re reboot. That is something else I could rant about, by the way, at some point. Um, so I did run GURPS Traveler, um, but it was not a successful game, and it ran into a, t a, t a typical Traveler problem, um, which is that Traveler can be approached in such a way as to make a referee think that they don't have to do any work, and that the players will do all the story driving for the referee, and that can work, but usually it doesn't. And the referee has to do a substantial amount of work. And if they don't, the campaign is going to be feel super fat and flabby. Um, so. Well, 
we could talk more about RPG stuff. Um, I'm kind of inclined to n try to not do that here on this stream, at least. Maybe have an RPG stream it separately at some point, but you know, then time gets to be a factor. And um, we got to fit it in somewhere, and I'm not convinced we can fit it in at this point. So um, we have uh, this week. Uh, we got this tonight. I'll be participating in the... You, you may not see me um, or hear me, uh, but I will be behind the scenes on the, the connection stuff for the next couple of days and possibly on Thursday or Friday as well, at least on Friday. Um, and tomorrow we have a flip-through of something new and exciting, and I'll, I'll uh, give you a preview. Against the Dark Master, it is big. There will be a flip-through of it tomorrow, which is not a comprehensive flip-through or rules overview, but I have had the PDF for some time. And so I have actually... I go into the flip-through knowing a fair amount about the game and can talk uh, about it like not a total moron. Um, so that's tomorrow... Uh, I don't have a Wednesday video so far. That could change, but it's unlikely to, given the demands of the rest of the week. Uh, and then Thursday's unboxing, which will be in synchronization with the Armchair Dragoons uh, for their unboxing day. My unboxing will be the Wars of Marcus Aurelius from Hollenspiel. Um, it's about 60 bucks, I think, which is about what a... Uh, any RPG core book costs, to be honest about it. So, it is a big book. It's it's a, it's in the neighborhood of 600 pages, and it's on nice thick paper. It's black and white inside, though, where the the current standard for RPG books is actually full color everything. Um, I am personally totally com content with black and white. So, uh, any art's good. So. Um, it is, you'll watch the video, you'll see why I'm, I'm hot about it, so. Not hot in a bad or angry sense, hot as in I am very excited about this game. Um, and then after that, the following week, uh, the following week's video will be another Harn video. So, we are cooking on that as well. So, um, maybe next week we'll read it, because I don't think I'll be ready to make a, a, a pitch um, for an RPG campaign next week. One thing that is kind of necessary to do it is some kind of, of meeting online meeting solution. And the Distributed Wargamer uh, conference uh, for the Connections conference was actually super useful because he went through a bunch of the options for Zoom or Discord or Slack or whatever. Um, I think the one I would end up using would be StreamYard, whether it would be streamed or not. And th at that level, you kind of need to have the pay StreamYard, which costs 30 bucks a month, which is a thing that, you know, we're, we're going to have to work toward that, right? So, anyway. Uh, Patchwork Pictures. Is there a series rule system that handles multiple historic eras? So if we're talking about RPGs, then sure, GURPS does it. Uh, if we're talking about war games, there have been attempts to do that. One of the, actually, it's funny we're talking about GURPS, because one of the things that they had in the pipeline for years, and it never actually materialized, was a, a generic universal miniatures game called Hot Lead. And um, it never materialized, and I suspect that it was because of the challenge of saying, okay, we have to, on the one hand, to, you know, have rules that work for cavemen with sticks and on the other hand we have to have rules for you know uh mobile infantry with nuclear weapons right so so how do we handle that um a strictly points based system would seem to be inadequate and a logarithmically scaling system like for example the old dc heroes rpg had so that it could handle both jimmy olsen and superman um, would seem to be ridiculous. Um, 
so that product never came out. Um, we do have the Great Battles of History. Now, that's a storied game system in a number of ways. Um, the second, third, or fourth, I think, um, Great Battles of History game was Lion of the North, which is Gustavus Adolphus's battles. And so that's very different from the Battles of Alexander and the Roman Republic that the first couple of games handled, right? Um, it was eventually decided by somebody... <laughs> I don't know if that was GMT or the designers, which were Richard Berg and Mark Herman, or what, um, but that they weren't going to continue doing modern-ish or early modern topics in Great Battles of History, and eventually that kind of spilled off into its own system um, called Musket and Pike, which is several games from GMT, and it's a related system. Same thing happened with Men of Iron. Um, it's a related system. It, it has definitely some DNA of Great Battles of History. Um, the Jour de Gloire system, that also applies to that. Although Jour de Gloire has a different feel because it has a very different component style. But that's just that. Um, Prestige, that's, that's true, but that's all ancient or medieval. Um, where GBOH does both ancient and what I would call medieval as well. So we have, you know, stuff reaching backward all the way back to Chariots of Fire, which is ancient Mesopotamia, 3000 3, BC, that, those type of things, um, all the way forward to about the 14 or 1500s, where we have the, the game set in Japan. I'm not even leaving out Land of the North. We have the games set in feudal Japan, which are in the 15th, 16th, 17th century, something like that, um, plus the Mongol games with Devil's Horsemen, um, so there's a huge range of games uh, of of eras that can be and have been handled by either Great Battles of History or one of its several offshoots. Um, I am not sure that I can name another example that has had a similar impact. Um, certainly, I. We have repeatedly heard people asking for something using a similar system to the great campaigns of the American Civil War, but working with instead Napoleonics or with, um, say, American Revolution. Uh, both of those are things that that have been noodled around with by various people. Um, and I'm not convinced that would work, but I'm not because the scale of a Napoleonic campaign is quite different from a, the scale of uh or, or many napoleonic campaigns anyway not all of them as as is seen in the kevin zucker campaigns of napoleon series where there has to be three or three or four different scales the times one the times three and the times five or times two or whatever it is um because on the one hand it's handling this kind of this campaign in france in 19, 1814 that takes place in a relatively small area east of paris um on to um, Highway to the Kremlin, which takes place in Russia, and which the maps for which have quite a large chunk of Russia in it, and, and Russia is big, right? Um, Tony Mammel also points out commands and colors. Um, I think commands and colors, there's a commands and colors for almost everything at this point. Off the top of my head, and I will forget something, there is... U.S. Civil War, World War II, Ancients, Medieval, Samurai Battles, World War I, um, American Revolution, Jacobite Rebellion, that's a standalone game, Spaceships in the Far Future. Um, I am forgetting at least one Commands and Colors game, so it has proved to be a pretty versatile system too. Uh, on the other hand, I think that it achieves that, and this is not a dig against it particularly. I like Commands and Colors for what it's worth. Um, it achieves that by having a pretty high level of abstraction, right? Such that the basic mechanic, and they're all a little different, right? But not super duper different. Um, the basic mechanic, I'd actually kind of like to try the spaceship one, to be honest. Um, I have played Ancients, Napoleonics, Memoir 44... I am not interested in World War One tactical World War One. That sounds dreadful to me. Um, I could be wrong. I, I may change my mind on that. It sounds dull. 
Um, I'm not interested in samurai battles to a degree. I'm, I mean, I'm, I've got the samurai battles games for GBOH. I'm, I'm, I'm covered. I'm good. I've got all the samurai battle material I can deal with. And in a game system that I like. Now, all those um, GBOH games are a little bit different, too. Some of them are rather radically different. There's a game in the series on ancient naval war, warfare, for example, War Galley. Obviously, that doesn't use the same mechanics at all. Um, the, the Caesar and Alexandria uses quite a different system. This is why not every game in the series can be used with the simple GBOH rules, because some of them are different enough. I have not. You are. Patchwork Pictures is correct. There is a fantasy version, the name of which I don't remember, um, and which someone will mention in the chat, I'm sure. And there's a Game of Thrones, Battle Lore, thank you. Um, and there's a Game of Thrones fantasy version, which is not really a fantasy version, I don't think. I don't know. I've never played it. I have no interest in that whatsoever. Um, I will tell you that I have played, it's been a while, the Game of Thrones board game, and I actually had fun every time I, we. Tr I, I got played it two or three times, and I've I've had fun every time with that. It's a pretty good game. Now I played the original edition. I don't know about the new one. Um, operational level Vietnam War game. They're all either tactical, strategic, or coin. Well, the the Fire in the Lake is definitely a strategic level game. As is, ooh, we got an orange counter here somewhere. Um, as it, oh, poop. Uh, All different colors. We're going to have to take this apart. That's okay. Um, I would call the Victory Games Nick Carp Vietnam an operational game. Um, it has scenarios of operational scope, and you can play the full game if you want and end up with a game that covers the strategic side of the conflict, um, but at, at its root, uh, I believe it to be an operational system. So... I will tell you, I mean, if you don't know that uh, GMT is coming out with a new version of the Victory Games Vietnam, um, it is a seminal game on a topic which has not often been... Uh, Wargaming as a hobby has not often been up to the challenge of doing the Vietnam War. Um, except at the tactical level where it's easier to deal with. Um, so, uh, and I'll also mention, uh, this is, you know, an upcoming thing, and, and Pat's a friend, so take this for what it's worth, but uh, I think that uh, the upcoming A Hot Dry Season from Legion War Games, which is up for pre-order on their website right now, is another operational um, Vietnam game that is worth your time. Uh, I... I think that's a fantastic game. Um, well, lo loved it. Um, I know Pat has uh, further games in the series which will not be that mechanically similar in mind. And I think he's talked about uh, Lam San 719, so I don't think I'm spoiling anything by telling you that. An operational Vietnam... Ooh, man. Um, I, I Honestly, I don't trust anything Vietnam that SPI did. I just don't. It, I think it's too... It's too, it's too contemporary for when it was made, for SPI uh, to um, to do a good job on a Vietnam game. And I think you're, I think you're, the, I don't know, I don't know if about you're in the rat, you're the rat. I don't want to misstate and say something stupid. Um, So it, it may well be a, a Vietnam game, um, or an operational game, I should say. I, I, I know it is a Vietnam game. Um, we're, yeah, we're doing pretty good here. Um, I think these gray units, the gray colored units, are um, the non-formation units. They're like the generic miscellaneous stuff and that's why there's a ton of them uh there is that there is an adam stark weather that is an operational game at least it, it purports to be an operational game um i had it i really didn't glance very closely at it and it went away i think in a pay it forward at one point it did have very attractive components i will will say that um it's a it's a 
interesting series. Um, it has it's a factorless series. That is something that I think can work well and has seldom been done well. Um, one place where I think it is done well is, for example, um, Unconditional Surrender, which I think is a very clever... I think there's some problems with it, but I think it's... A, I really like the basic, the basic mechanisms. It is a mechanism that runs the entire thing, which is what I think is neat. Um, there is an Operational Surrender... Unconditional Surrender. Um, World War One coming, which I gotta tell you I'm not terribly intrigued by, and supposedly there's a Pacific version in the works which I am curious to see, but I am not convinced that that game system will do a good job handling the Pacific. Um, the Pacific theater of World War II is a super challenging topic, and that's why a lot of uh, different groups and companies have had a hard time making it work. Um, it's, I mean, there's, there's a lot of relatively high abstraction games on the Pacific theater that work fine, like Victory in the Pacific... You know, and uh, oh, Pacific Tide is supposed to be pretty good, for example. Um, but it, doing it as a, like a, a a comprehensive simulation has always proved to be extremely difficult because honestly, the traditions of wargaming don't really mostly apply to naval stuff. Um, it's so different, and and the games that it works well. I have no idea what these things are. Um, the games that that uh, where it works well, something like Flat Top has, you know, they they're built completely from scratch to accommodate Pacific naval and air war. So sixty five, I thought was another tactical thing. Uh, so the Victory Games Vietnam game, um, which is going to be redone by GMT. So. Uh, what we know about that is it's going to get new components. Uh, it's going to have a larger map footprint. It's going to be three maps instead of two, which is done to accommodate larger hexes and larger counters. That's nice because my eyes aren't getting any better. That's for sure. Um, here's the thing with the Victory Games Vietnam. It's it it is and as I said before, it is a seminal game. Um, it is flatly assuming you are willing to deal with high complexity and long play time and a relatively large footprint um it is the best game on of its kind right and it's and it's not close um that that has been published to date however that said it was designed in 1983-84 um and there's there's a lot of problems with the available sources that were available at that time it is not I mean, it, there are still problems finding sources for the Vietnam War, to be honest. Uh, but it's not nearly as bad as it was. There's a lot better sources available now than there were at the time. And and because of that, there's a lot of problems that are kind of built into the Victory Games Vietnam War game that probably wouldn't be the case if it were being designed today with the same approach. Um Mitch Land, who is going to be the developer on this, has said, I'm paraphrasing, and if Mitch wants to correct me in a comment, that's totally okay, um, that they intend to change as little as possible. Um, there are some small map corrections that they've talked about and some small order of battle unit corrections that they've talked about, and everything else is basically going to stay the same. And, and they're going to improve the play aid situation, which is a must-do at this point. Uh, because the standards for play aids, for player aids at in 1984 were just way different than they are now. Um, I expect it to be a beautiful package. It is a dynamite value at I think $59 for six counter sheets and three maps plus a pile of player aid cards and multiple rule books. Um, so if it looks interesting at all to you, bearing in mind that it is going to not solo well at all. Um, if it looks at all appealing, you should absolutely jump on it. And yes, I have pre-ordered it. Um, okay. Okay. 
Stigler, uh, biggest tur Stigler says, biggest hurdle to a good Vietnam game is a Western mindset. Uh, I think there's a lot of truth to that, actually. I, I don't think you can argue with that, actually. Um, but specifically to the Western wargaming mindset, it's, a, it's another difficult topic because it is not, strictly speaking, a conventional war. And a conventional war is a land war, right? Um, naval wars are... Maybe somebody should try to do a universal naval war system. That might be interesting to be handling. I mean, naval wars. Um, they almost always have a land component, but not always. Like the Anglo-Dutch wars, at least at least one of the Anglo-Dutch wars was entirely a naval war. Um, so, actually, a lot of the wars that the Dutch participated in were entirely naval wars because that's that's what they were good at. Um, a lot of the English language's nautical terminology, like bosun and and starboard and all that stuff, a lot of that comes to English from Dutch. Not sure. Wargaming audience might quite a, quite a few of you might know that. I mean, certainly. Um, one has to ask the question of. When, when evaluating the universality of a game system or set of game mechanics, how detailed do you want it to be, right? If you want it to be quite detailed, then you're going to, I think, end up with something that either is busted or is really complicated. Um, if you are willing to put up with something that is much more abstract, like, say, commands and colors, um, then I'm, I'm making it sound like... like I don't like commands and colors, and that's not true, but I do have a preference for more detailed, complicated games. That's, I mean, I'll cop to that. Uh, but that does not mean that simple games are necessarily crappy or, or easier to design. I think they're harder to design in most ways. Um, you're going to end up with something that's either de super detailed and crappy or super abstract. So... Uh, so that it can handle as much as possible with as little overhead as possible. Uh, somebody asked about the District Commander games. Those are from Hollenspiel. Um, I don't... I'm not familiar with those. I, I think one of them is a Vietnam game. Um, and... <clears throat> how... how oh, oh. Is that a tactical game? I mean, it's one of those gray area things that I, it might be clear to me if I'd played it, but I haven't played it and really haven't looked at it. Uh, they do look interesting, I will say. Now, I'll, I'll be honest. I, I'm I'm not sold on the reply value on a lot of the stuff that Hollenspiel does, although some of it definitely has quite a bit of replay value. Um, but their their games are almost all very interesting. There's all almost always something really interesting happening there, either with the topic or with the mechanics or with the approach or something um so you know I, and they and they do straight hex encounter stuff sometimes too all right um Block Oddity says, Naval wars have an in inherent, intrinsic, political, economic reach which can't be ignored in, in a model. Obviously, this is true with all war, but it's even more difficult to separate. Uh, yeah, that's true. Um, it, it's an enormous challenge to industrial and logistic capability to, pr to be able to project naval power. And in that sense, um, those are almost always going to be important things, depending on the game scope, right? So if you're like a um, strategic level world uh, Pacific War game, like like an Empire of the Sun, um, that is a thing that you could either you can build into the cards or into the reinforcement schedule, which is how or replacement schedule, which is how uh, it works. So the you the allies get like re reinforcements on a schedule in Empire of the Sun. The Japanese do not. There are a few cards that give the Japanese replacements. And if they never come up, they never come up. Um, that works, I think, because of the scale of the game. Um, and, I mean, there is some level at which Empire of the Sun is the, the, the master class of game design about the Pacific War of, in World War II, right? So...
Avalanche Press does have a series of naval games. Um, in fact, Gilbert Collins has done some video on them. So if you are interested, I think, um, go check out Gilbert's videos on those. Or at least has mentioned it in a video. I'm not sure he had a designated vid dedicated video on those games. Um, you might find something about them in a video called Games I Don't Like or Games I Don't Play. Um, Kyle Reese, do we think the Finnish-Soviet conflict will work out well with the OCS series rules in their new East Front game? Uh, since it was kind of guerrilla warfare. Um, so... The OCS thing in the pipeline that will deal with that is called the Hero City, um, which is basically the Leningrad front. And OCS in general has some relatively, in various OCS games, some, some relatively abstract rules for guerrilla warfare type stuff. Um, in a lot of cases, it's a marker that you put down somewhere in the, behind the lines that indicates that supply lines are disrupted, for example. Um, this could easily do that. There's an actual front line as well. Um, in the part of the Winter War that the Hero City will cover, um, and I, have, I foresee no particular problem with that, but that's going to be a bit of a sideshow, too. Um, I'm a big fan of Gilbert's uh, whole channel. I've been watching Gilbert for years. F fantastic. Gilbert Collins. Uh, this he is the designer of Mr. Madison's War from GMT and the upcoming War for America from Compass Games, which looks super duper interesting and uh, which uh, is one of my more anticipated games of the year. It is a game about the Revolutionary War, by the American Revolutionary War, by the way, uh, designed from the British point of view, which is cool. I mean, no, I've never seen anybody else do that. I mean, that doesn't mean there hasn't been, but I haven't seen it. Um, trying to find everybody that's not gray. Gilbert does a lot of stuff on at some point I, I want to do this and I wanted to actually start that out soft today by mentioning Ricardo's channel as as a pointer to other channels that I think are of interest to the folks who stop by so Ricardo Gilbert Collins uh, we'll talk about additional selections uh, in future shows um, since I don't want it to take a ton of time with it, but uh, but I do want people to uh, in, be able to enjoy the spectrum of what's available for wargaming on YouTube too. Uh, Gilbert has done a ton of of uh, videos on various Gettysburg games. Yeah, John Longshore, I've seen that. Call it's called the Finnish Trilogy, and I don't remember offhand who did it. Um, I know that it is uh, very collectible and very expensive, and I believe it to be a European publisher. And I don't. I'm not. I mean, I've seen them. They, they pop up on eBay from time to time, and. Um, it's, I've never been particularly tempted by them. Let me put it that way. If, if you really are into that topic, however, um, yeah, I, I mean, I would consider, uh, more a game like, uh, that game that GMT did on the Winter War years and years ago, for example, I'd consider something like that, um, more than I'd consider a giant, comprehensive, exhaustive three-game trilogy on the topic. I, I, that's overkill, dependent on my level of interest. Alan Salazar asks, what topic I want to see most in a war game? Maybe a good topic for another Clipper show, just curious. Um, I want to see Operational Ancients. That's what I want to see. Um... And we have historically, haha, not had 
um, a lot of takers on that topic at that level. There are a few. There's the Ancient World series from um, GMT and Richard Berg, which which is I, I've I've played Rise of the Roman Republic and I liked it a lot. I like that series a lot. I do think it shows it shows its Berg parody uh, pedigree. Let me put it that way. Um, it's uh, there's a lot of like nested tables and stuff like that. The, the mechanics that Berg liked and that I think would be better handled now with something like cards or something like that. Um, there's Imperium Romanum, uh, the Al Nafi game, originally from West End Games, I believe, and then republished by West End Games as Imperium Romanum 2, and then has been redone now by Decision Games as Al Nafi's Imperium Romanum. Um, that's an operational game, and... It's it, there's also uh, Trajan the ancient. What's this thing called? I can never remember the name of this thing. Uh, a series from Decision called called. I gotta type it correctly to make it work, but I have stuff stacked on the keyboard. The Ancient Wars series, which is a four or five game series from Decision Games, not all of which quite fit together. Um, I mean, Kaiser Bill, you are absolutely right about that, but that's also true. That's true of any. I mean, look at Zama, the Battle of Zama, the big con for the final confrontation of the Second Punic War between um, Hannibal and the the uh, the the great Scipio Africanus. Um, where are we getting the order battle for that battle? And there's been multiple. I mean, there's at least half a dozen games on that battle, including the GBOH one, but not limited to that. How are we believing? Are we believing Levy, who wrote a couple of hundred years later, or are we believing Herodotus, which is which they give completely different impressions of who was present at the battle and what the uh, numerical superiority of the Roman army was? Um, SPQR does not do that. SPQR is tactical. So, um, if if I were to des and again I, I I say this again uh, if I were to des I am most tempted to fill the need uh, by trying to design something for operational ancients than anything else because it's an it's a I think it's interesting um, I like operational stuff and there have been only a handful of games that have even tried to do it so over the fifty year. Well, it's more than that, but um, I'm I'm going to say that for my purposes, the hobby starts with SPI. I know that's not true. I know that it starts with Avalon Hill, but bluntly, a lot of the stuff that Avalon Hill released before that point was pretty primitive and I think doesn't hold up particularly today. Um, that is something that we could talk about. Uh, Ancients computer games. I played the pants off of Rome Total War, the first one. I have never been successful in getting into the sequel. Um, I don't have the Paradox Roman game. It looks dreadful. The, the, the problem with um, many Roman <coughs> games about the Roman period is that they want to treat you as Rome. And the interesting things that were going on with Rome were happening in within Rome, within the Empire, within the Roman Republic, and not necessarily... Um, things that were happening between the Roman Empire or Roman Republic and some external party somewhere. This is one thing that Imperium Romanum gets right, where you might have three different, three or four different Roman factions involved in a given scenario. Um, there is Field of Glory, um, which is a sort of ch uh, fairly simple chess-like game uh, that does various ancient battles. There's a medieval one now too, and it's it's not bad. Um, None of that is operational, and nor nor is the Total War strate that strategic map thing that makes no sense. It's like, oh, we have we have to explore this this land that has been traded it with by the Phoenicians for fifteen hundred years. That's ridiculous. Um, it, it's even more ridiculous in like the Napoleon and Empire games. But I I, I got stale on the Total War games relatively early, and. I played a lot of the first medieval as well, by the way. And I think 
where those games shine the best, the Total War games, are in the tactical game. But the tactical game doesn't interest me as much uh, because I, I find the controls crude and hard to deal with. So, on the other hand, I mean, in terms of like the way the individual battles look, it's all phenomenal and has been for a long time. So, Petra Pictures, yes, that is exactly the kind of thing I'm talking about. The ability of a, an army to feed itself, right? Uh, the need to protect the baggage trains and that, that kind of thing. Um, that would require uh, quite a lot of research. And, I mean, it, that would be super challenging to do because you'd have to, you'd have to read a lot of stuff on primary sources. And it's not just Roman stuff that I'm talking about. It's... Like the Peloponnesian War, which is in large part a naval war, right? Um, would be very interesting to, to see an operational treatment of that, and I, which I do not think we have seen from anybody. Um, the epic of the Peloponnesian War from the Clash of Arms might be the closest thing uh, that I can think of. Uh, Tony Mammel, what would I say is the simplest game which gives a taste of an operational level game for those who haven't gotten into that already? Um... The, the Mighty Endeavor, I would say. Very much operational. But it's a simple game, right? So you're not going to get things like logistics. I mean, there is log a logistic system in there. But it's quite simple, right? Um, where you basically trace to HQs. It's more complicated than that. But um, uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, the Campaigns of Alexander. The very interesting... Um, topics that I think could be treated and, and that I really kind of wanted to see Richard Berg tackle with the Ancient World series and for whatever reason um, it just never th th we did two of two games and he stalled before he got to anything that was really interesting although um, I think both the first Punic War which is the subject of Carthage and the Samnite Wars which is the subject of Rise of the Roman Republic are actually more interesting than people give them credit for what do I think of alternate history games says Mickey Juif Juif um, I mean that's a in general it is not uh, an area of extreme interest to me. I own very few of those, relatively speaking. Uh, to some, and this is just me. To some people, that's like where it's at, right? They want alternate history stuff. I mean, uh, Ty Bamba has made a career out of doing alt history uh, games, and that's fine. I, but largely, I'm not interested. Um, there is plenty of interesting actual history to explore. I think now I do have. Three games, I think, on NATO versus Warsaw Pact. Or three games either here or coming. Um, uh, maybe four. Yeah, I think four. Um, and then I have Case uh, Plan Orange, the Mark Herman variant of Empire of the Sun. Um, and that might be it actually now there's certainly other games i have that have alt history scenarios and and i am of course aware that to some extent everything we are doing and talking about is an alt history situation um that's fine but i think if you start with historical assumptions i think you still have plenty to work with without dipping into uh the like the really extreme what ifs also if we say Let's say we have a your your what if is what if the South won the Civil War? Okay, what then in terms of game design? I mean, are you going to design a game about the Civil War to demonstrate that the South could have won? Um, are you going to then extrapolate this a, a victorious South in the Civil War to thirty years down, like Harry Turtledove does, to thirty or fifty years later, where the two you know, the, 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 the Union and the Confederacy come to blows again in a World War One type of scenario. Um, so y your what if tends to actually be outside the scope of the actual game that you end up with. Um, the, the what if, the, the big question, uh, Tomorrow the World is a pretty famous game. I, I want to say it was a Thai Bomba game. I forget who the publisher was. Somebody will look it up and say so. Um, but it's a you know it's a it's a 
Axis wins World War II, and now the Nazis and the, the Japanese are, are going at it. Um, the interesting question there is how that happened in the first place, not the fact that the Japanese and the Germans are now at war. Um, so this is a thing that was explored in the Man in the High Castle series from uh, Amazon, which is worth, worth your time, by the way. Oh, that's true. I do have the GMT next. In fact, they're right behind me, and I always... Well, they're, they're, they're hidden behind the Kiev to Rostov. That's my excuse. Um, I do have those, and those are all hypotheticals as well. However, those are hypotheticals, unlike the NATO versus Warsaw Pact, which is fat past history, uh, which didn't happen. The, the GMT Next War series is future history, which might happen. Um... And I think it's a it's in a bit of a different category for that reason. It's it's speculative, but not alt history. Um, that is a somewhat pedantic point, I think. But nevertheless, to to me, it is important. Yeah, patchwork pictures. Could the South have worn without the time traveling South Africans? Which is the Harry one of the Harry Turtle Dove things going on in the Guns of the South, I believe. Um, some of the how much Harry Turtle have I read? I, I read one of those Videsos books, which was very dry, and I read most of the World War series, which was also very dry. Um, despite so the the premise of World War is that it's World War II. I think it's 1942. World War II is raging and still up in the air, and aliens invade. Um, it is a hell, it, it, fantastically fun idea, um, and. To a point, the series is fun, but I think I think Turtle Dove in general gets lost in the weeds. Well, I mean, so Man in the High Castle is in fact based on a science fiction series from Philip K. Dick, or a science fiction book by Philip K. Dick. There was no series, and he was asked at one point uh, why there wasn't a sequel, and he was like, "That's way too depressing a subject matter," which is really understandable. So Brant mentions, as as he should, that the that the the distinction that I'm drawing between past history that didn't happen, like the NATO versus Warsaw Pact stuff, and future history which could happen, is entirely dependent on when I am making the determination. If I made that determination in 1983, then yes, the the NATO versus Warsaw Pact stuff is completely contemporary. It is near future hypothetical, and I I think that is a different topic than alternate history. And I think we consider now, we consider the NATO versus Warsaw Pact stuff to be alternate history because it is past history that didn't happen rather than future history that could theoretically happen. And, and again, you know, I will, I will accept arguments that this is pedantic because it kind of is. But um, at the same time, this is the distinction that is most important to me. So, the most interesting. So, I, I think I, I was watching Godzilla vs. Kong the other day, and I made a joking post on Twitter about this, but I'm absolutely right. Of I'm watching the movie, and there's like humans on screen doing things and talking. Why? I am not watching this movie to watch humans saying, oh, and yammering. I'm watching, I will, I am watching to see giant monsters smashing shit, which the movie did, in fairness, deliver. Um, but why am I watching these humans? And, and the World War series basically, I thought, suffered from the same things, where... Turtle Dove wants to invest you in the human drama of these characters, and the fact is that very few of the characters are interesting at all, and those who are, are the aliens, um, which are actually fairly interesting. So, um, so yes, Brent, you're absolutely right. It, it, it does totally be... Well, I mean, if the geopolitical situation sufficiently changes, then then yeah. I mean, um, that does not necessarily mean one cannot be into both sides, both answers to that question. That is completely legit. Um, 
So, I mean, I joked about it. It's like, why are the first of all, there are talented actors in here who should fire their agents. And secondly, why are there humans on screen? I do not wish to see these humans. Please show me the giant monkey. Also, it is a really, really stupid move. I mean, it's it's wall to wall stupid. Um, nothing about it makes any sense, and, and the only reason it works at all is because you went not expecting to see like a serious, serious exploration of the Hollow Earth theory. Uh, you went to see giant monsters smashing stuff, and you got that. So, um. We have, I mean, we have a war game on tanks versus Godzilla, which is, not Godzilla specifically, but the creature that ate Sheboygan, which I've always wanted to play, and I've never, never had it or played it, which is unfortunate, because I'm sure it's a ton of fun. South China Sea Breaking the Chains, those are also near future hypothetical. Now, I'm not familiar with those particular games, uh, but if you're interested in those topically, then uh, I believe they're relatively well regarded. Relatively well regarded. Um, I have not seriously investigated them. Although I was interested enough in, I mean, I'm interested enough in the next war, the GMT next war series. I I see why it's named that. Um, but it is, I always feel like I have to clarify whether I'm talking about the GMT Next War series or the SPI The Next War, which was designed by Jim Dunnick and, and developed by Mark Herman. Um, so that's a little bit irritating. Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. All right. Trying to figure out where, what's going where here because there's stuff everywhere. Are these gray? These look gray. Or are these green? They're gray. Compass Games Blue Water Navy. Uh, that is a modern game, isn't it, John? I could be wrong about that. Or is that an 80s thing? There is a Pacific, that's that's the Atlantic, there is a Pacific Companion coming uh, for that as well. And Blue Water Navy, I've seen, I've seen people express uh, their admiration for that. Alright, let's see. That goes there. This goes here. There's a lot of Bailey Bridges in this game, as you'd imagine. So, baggies. Um, the baggies that you get in the war games, I do end up using them, but you are by far better off going to Walmart, as much as I hate to recommend it, and buying these baggies. This is like, there's like a hundred bags in here for something like two dollars. And they have multiple sizes. You can get tiny sizes or big sizes or pretty much whatever you want. Well, that's annoying. Okay, John, thank you. Um, I have had the vague impression that that was a modern thing, but I, I mean, clearly I'm not right, so. Um, Patrick Pictures, are you asking about South China Sea or uh, Blue Water Navy? I haven't played either one, I, I'll tell you that. Uh, 
I um, I, there, Kaiser Bill, there's people that do that. Uh, I, I think Callendale does that actually. Um, I that makes me shudder to be honest. <laughs> that just the hassle of dealing with that. But at the same time, I should probably warm to it a little bit because it would enable me to store certain games in the box with the, that the game comes in, as opposed to storing it in fifty million other boxes. Um, which is something I prefer not to do. So right now, for example, I hate bulging boxes because that's how boxes get wrecked and corners get blown. My Devil's Cauldron box is like this this high right now because of the way I have them sorted. It would make way more sense for me to do it in Ziploc bags. Ah. Delicious, delicious scotch. At some point, we'll we'll have a bitch session about the hassle of buying scotch in Ohio. Although, I went to a um, we were at the grocery store, and this particular grocery store had the lick, the state liquor selection, and uh, there's some some things there that I had not seen before. Uh, they had the Port Charlotte uh, expression from Brooklady. Uh, they had Pendarin, which I've never seen in Ohio before. Pendarin is a single malt Welsh whiskey um, that I have heard is really good, and I have never seen it. Uh, well, I, that's not true. I've seen it in Kentucky. I've never seen it in Ohio. Uh, Rittenhouse Rye, I have a bottle of that sitting over there on the shelf. Uh, to be completely honest with you, I am trying to get rid of the last bottle of scotch that I bought, uh, which is this stuff so that I can go buy another bottle of scotch. So we may be, just like we will be probably dealing with time for trumpets for the next several weeks, um, we will probably be um, dealing with the last of the Glenlivet um, Caribbean Reserve for the next several weeks. Until maybe get... So we're, I'm, I will be fully vaccinated on the 29th, so maybe I can have guests over and have them drink the scotch. So that would, <laughs> I went back to Ohio, but my liquor was gone. So my wife is from Akron, um, which is where the Pretenders are from, by the way. Um, Cahoga, she pronounces it for some, for, probably for some music -y reason, Cahoga Falls. Nobody calls it Cahoga Falls. It's Cuyahoga Falls. Um, and uh, we have many friends that live in Cuyahoga Falls, or, or near Cuyahoga Falls. So the Cuyahoga River is the river, the biggest river, I think, in northern Ohio. Uh, and it's the river that um, exits into Lake Erie at Cleveland. And it's also the, the infamous Cleveland River that was on fire at one point in the 50s or 60s or something like that. Yeah, but she's the one that counts, so... So there, the, because of the whiskey, so there's a couple variables there. One is the whiskey boom, which has made older whiskey just higher priced. And then there's, for imported whiskey, there is the trade war that we've been in for the last couple of years inexplicably, which has raised prices noticeably on scotch specifically. Now, in some cases, some of those scotches were migrating upwards in price anyway, like uh, Macallan, for example. But now... Uh, old Pulteney is like forty dollars a bottle. It used to be twenty-seven. Um, so, oops, that one doesn't go with these. That one doesn't go with these. Uh, the counters are kind of all over the place here, um, where they'll be like a. I don't see any here, but like in the middle of these blue, this blue unit, which looks like it's the first army. Uh, you'll have like a Bailey Bridge counter, so I've got to kind of pay a little closer attention than I would normally prefer to. I do have a copy of the Time for Time for Trumpets, the book. I haven't had a chance to read it yet. Truthfully, it's probably in a storage unit. Uh, most of my books are in a storage in the storage unit still. Uh, China and India, actually. Uh, that's why uh, the Indians have started making their own single malt whiskey uh, 
The one that I know you can get in the States is called Amrut, which is supposed to be pretty good. But again, it's something I've only seen in Kentucky. And, you know, when I went to Kentucky, I bought some stuff, but I can't buy everything, right? For, you know, 60 to to $100 a bottle, I can't buy everything. I might walk out of there with maybe as many as... I think I, think I bought five bottles of scotch once in, in one shopping trip. And I, I'll probably never buy as much scotch as that again in one shot. Well, that's pretty good. I'm not buying collector scotch, though. For, mostly because I can't afford the collector scotch. I am... Uh, much more likely to buy a bottle. My my like practical ceiling for scotch is probably about 90 bucks a bottle. Um, I'm not sure I've ever paid more than that. And I'm not 100% sure I ever will, although inflation is probably going to make me change my mind at some point. We are done clipping for the evening. Um, but, that said, um, I very seldom spend as much as 90 bucks. I mean, I, I, my sweet spot is in the 50, is in the. It's hard to it's there's just not much available for in the fifty dollar range anymore. Even um, even um, Lafroig is sixty some dollars now. So, um, which is why things like. I'm not so of like the like the, the super easy to find scotches that you see in like most restaurants, like your uh, Glenfiddich and your Glenmorangie and your Macallan. Um, I think Macallan is bluntly, dramatically overpriced at the moment, uh, but is very good. It's just overpriced. Um, and um, of the others. I think I like Glenmorangie the best, but that's probably not true if you're not like a Scotch person. Um, uh, I'm not talking about like the 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 specialist cast finishes or anything like that. Some of those are really good, actually. The Quinta Ruban, which I'm not sure it's called that anymore, uh, that's the I think that's the port uh, cast finish. Those that's really good. Um, the Nectar Door, which is the a French wine cask finish, I'm not crazy about, uh, but the the port cask, and there was another one that I that I really liked. But even like the regular uh, Glen Morangie is still only like it's like under forty dollars a bottle, and there's very little single malt that you can buy in that price range anymore that isn't total garbage. Um, the um, fine oak versions of Macallan are. Only a thing because they ran out of regular Macallan. Um, I would not do the fine oak either. Um, not to say that it's not okay. It's probably fine, but it's it's it, it's too expensive because of the name of what it is. Macallan has become kind of the 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 Jack Daniels of of Scotch in that you are paying an extra twenty to thirty dollars for the label, and I'm not a fan. Um, I am a fan of the whiskey. I think McCallum is fantastic whiskey. So, um, I had uh, I won't go into the story in detail because it's gross. But uh, I had a, a ne let's let's say a negative um, Scotch experience when I was in uh, not very long out of high school, and I uh, didn't touch Scotch for years, and it was McCallum that. Um, got me drinking scotch again. Uh, interestingly, missing Seattle, we have uh, I have now seen a couple of uh, local Ohio stores that do have Japanese single malt whiskey. Now, I don't know if they're any good. I have had a Japanese single malt um, that I liked. I've also had a French single malt called Bastille. I think the Bastille. We we joked that it was the French prison whiskey, um, and um, I'm aware that the Bastille was not like historically a prison but um i did not care for it it tasted like my great aunt's perfume so uh maker's mark is fine i i don't mind it i wouldn't drink it neat um i but i wouldn't drink most bourbons neat there's i mean 
I'd be happy, happily drink it in a cocktail or, or um, in um, uh, on the rocks. I, you know, I actually thought about it, and we may do this next week because I have ice in the frid- in the freezer right now. So I actually thought about gin and tonics for tonight, and then it did just didn't come together with everything else that was going on today. Um, I do have Hendrix gin and some very fancy tonic water, so which I should use before it does whatever tonic water does after too long. Some people do not like the peated scotch. That's the smoky flavor. Um, it's not just the smoky flavor, though. It can also be sort of an oily flavor. Um, um, Tobermory, for example, uh, it is not peated, but it, you'd never know that tasting it because it tastes like peat. But when we say it's not peated, we mean that the malt is not smoked over a peat fire. However, the water still comes into the distillery through a peat bog, so it still tastes peaty. Their peated expression, Ledeg, is one of my favorites. Can't get it in Ohio. Wish I could get it in Ohio. It's only about a 55 at least last I checked, it was only about a 55 or $60 bottle. Um, I wish I could get it here, but I can't. I'd have to go to Kentucky to, or Chicago to get it. Or order it. I mean, I could order it from friggin' Scotland, but that's... That's awfully expensive. You, it doesn't make sense unless you're ordering a case or two of booze, um, which I am not doing. So, negative gin experience. The, my negative scotch experience was with Grant's, which is shit. So, don't drink Grant's. Even, like, Dewar's is delightful compared to Grant's. Um, Dewar's on, uh, with a couple ice cubes in it is fine, actually. I have no problem with Dewar's particularly. I mean, I wouldn't want to be drinking it all night, necessarily. But... Um, I, I don't actually have a problem with doers. Uh, Johnny Walker Red, I wouldn't use in... I wouldn't drink that straight. I wouldn't drink it even on ice. Uh, mixed in a scotch cocktail, no problem. But I think there's probably better choices. I think you're better off, if you are you want cocktail scotch, you're better off with Famous Grouse or Black Grouse. Iowa. Woo-hoo. Yeah, well, I'm not going to Iowa either. We didn't even go through Iowa on our way to or from Colorado. So, I like a good martini as well, and I do not object to gin in any way. Um, I mean, I don't drink gin neat because that would be weird, but um, I, I like gin, and it's wonderful in cocktail. So, uh, Maker's Mark is a, is a, is a, is a wheated uh, bourbon that is a, a very trendy style of bourbon right now. Um, I, I think it's fine. I wouldn't not drink it, but I would probably drink it on the rocks. Uh, the, the, the Probably what kicked off the wheated bourbon thing is probably old uh, Pappy Van Winkle, and that is a not even a distillery it's something that they bought they bought casks from somebody else and blended something and released it as pappy van winkle and it turned into a thing there's no pedigree there um and the prices on it are absolutely ridiculous it's probably good but i mean it's you know when you're talking about paying fifteen hundred dollars for a bottle that's nah we're not we're we're not doing that There was some friends of mine in the camping scene that that literally their their idea of so there's two groups of friends <laughs> in the camping scene one of which brought you know had somebody that would bring 50 bottles of single malt scotch to to the camping event and the other group of people would bring um, a couple cases of Everclear and various sodas and Gatorades and things like that and we would basically put that together and sometimes that turned into something palatable and sometimes it did not. Uh, Gordon's Gin, I do not consider a good martini gin, but it is a splendid gin and tonic gin. Same with Beef Eater. I have a bo- I have a bottle of rum, which I have busted out for the stream, actually, and it's pretty good. I'm not a... I'm not knowledgeable about rum, um, but there, there, there is such a thing as good sip and rum, just as there is good sip and tequila. I just happen to know what good sip and tequila I like. Uh, as opposed to rum, where I'm still kind of trying to figure it out. Um, 
The tequila that I'm thinking of is Don Julio Añejo here in Ohio. That runs about 60 bucks. last I checked. Um, there is a, a Resposado as well, which I haven't tried. The Añejo is delightful. The Resposado is like aged. The Añejo is aged more. That's the and then there's the silver, which is which I also haven't tried. Uh, the the Blanco. Um, generally speaking, silver tequilas are not tasty to me. There's probably exceptions. In fact, I there are exceptions to that. Uh, I had a, a silver Añejo, a uh, silver mezcal, which is not tequila, but silver me, uh, mezcal years and years ago that was actually pretty good. Woodford Reserve is good. Um, certainly, if you're if you're doing cocktails, your world's your oyster. You can get away with buying very inexpensive uh, bourbons, bourbons or rye or or uh, uh, Irish whiskey, no problem. Scotch is a little harder, um, even not great. I mean, again, don't buy Grants, <laughs> but uh, you, uh, I think here in Ohio. Dewar's runs about 26 bucks a bottle, which is not bad. I have tried mezcal. Uh, it did have the worm in the bottle. Like I said, it was pretty good. That might have been the only mezcal I ever had. Eh, maybe not. I've never had the worm, though. That just it seems like a bad idea. Uh, Weller's is another one that's piggybacked on to the Pappy Craze and has been... Uh, very hard to find for the last several years. Um, fortunately, I have not really been bitten by that problem because I'm by am more interested in Scotch than I am bourbon. Um, as I think I've discussed, uh, my preference in American whiskey is for American rye whiskey and not bourbon. Um, not that they're not good bourbons, there are, uh, and certainly uh, bourbon. Co bur there's, uh, huge array of bourbon cocktails and I'd probably rather drink a bourbon cocktail than a scotch cocktail that just seems weird if it's a good scotch I'll just drink the scotch block oddity good move on the whiskey you yeah, know we're gonna fit we're gonna go on the stream we got 13 more minutes but I got quite a bit more whiskey here to go so I did refill this once so let's talk about what's coming so tomorrow we have the against the dark master I set it aside. Uh, RPG flip through. It's about a 25 minute video, as I recall, uh, but it's a 600. It's like a 600 page book. So, um, no, it's a 43 minute video. Uh, so it's a huge book. I mean, I do flip through every page, but I mean, I don't linger on every page. But we do. I do discuss a lot of the basic mechanical stuff. Um. um I generally find that, you know, I'm not doing tobacco anymore, so there's that. But I generally find that unpeated scotches go better with cigars than peated scotches. The smoke tends to compete with one another. Which cigar, I wouldn't know. I don't even remember um, off the top of my head. Certainly there were cigars I liked when I was buying cigars. We have an excellent cigar store right around the corner here. Um... Okay, uh, no video Wednesday. On Thursday we ha on Wednesday though we have the video with Dan, which will be on this channel. So tune in for that. I will put a card up for that tomorrow. Our topic is collection and collecting war games. That is, um, and uh, on Thursday we have the unboxing of the Wars of Marcus Aurelius, and then next Monday, of course, we will be back here with counter clipping. On Tuesday there will be a Harn video. Um, and I don't have an unboxing scheduled. I'm glad I didn't because we had new... So just so... Uh, let me mention this. I've got the... Um, I'll pull it up. Why not? Um, so I put the... Um, the patrons card at the end of every unboxing video. I do it on the unboxing videos because it is a scheduled video and I know it will be out every week. Um, so there's never like a question about what, uh, you know, whether I'm going to get the, the, the thank you patrons thing out, um, that week or not. I need to clearly fix this. Um, so here's the current card, right? I, I update this as soon as something changes, somebody drops or somebody 
there's a new patron. But because I try and schedule the videos out, I, I if the video is already made, I can't go back in and swap the card out. So I have to um, not work too far ahead. So since I made the card, this is updated, but the the card in the last two videos is not updated yet, right? So. So I'm trying to keep that straight and not have people who are, hey, signed up, thank you, patrons, um, and not have them wait a month before they see their name pop up. That's, I just don't want to do that. So uh, I am roughly six months nicotine-free and about 18 months tobacco-free. Um, I think I talked about I had a... I found some juice that had uh, that had uh, nicotine in it uh, in around September, and I vaped that for a couple of days, and uh, it, it, it provoked a negative reaction. Let me put it that way. So um, uh, after that, there hasn't been any nicotine. This this thing is all all just flavored stuff. Flavors currently are this thing that I mixed myself, which is garbage. Uh, we have a coconut thing that uh, I ran out of. There's a menthol grape, which sounds terrible now that I read the label. Cheesecake, which is okay. And this other thing that I don't know what it is. So, uh, Fucko is the local guy who, who lends me his stuff to do unboxing videos of. And provides various other flavor, favors and services. He was complaining that I, w that I wasn't thanking him profusely enough. So I had a video that ended with special thanks to Fucko. So. Um, so, but I just, that's something I want to talk constantly about because I don't want to constantly be begging for money, frankly. However, I will say that the sooner I hit a certain patreon threshold the sooner i can sign up for the Streamyard membership and and uh turn that into uh an online a weekly hopefully weekly uh but no more than bi-weekly uh, rpg thing that sounds fantastic uh, i love cheesecake and ice cream um the cheesecake flavor was okay this clove stuff because i was smoking cloves at one point is tastes like ass um, this clove stuff tastes more like cloves, but it still tastes pretty bad. So those are like my, those are my emergency backups. Um, you can get the, the juice and mix it yourself, the, like the, of whatever juice you want, the, whatever nicotine level you want. I was doing that for a while and it's very economical to do that. Um, cause the, the like half liter bottle costs $10 as opposed to, this, which costs about thirty, after all the taxes and shipping and all that shit. So, um, and I did get, I do get them through the mail. I mean, it's it's a lot less hard on your lungs than the tobacco is because it's not a combustion product, right? It is vapor. It is vaporized liquid. Um, so. It's probably not good for you exactly, but it's definitely not as harmful as, uh, as as like smoking actual cigarettes, um, or dipping, which is what I was doing for thirty, about thirty years, yeah, thirty nine years, I don't know, a long time. Um, so and I was going through a couple cans of dip a day. Thank God I was buying, and I was buying the cheap stuff. So. Sometimes, I, I see RPG, uh, Seth Skorkowski did a stream, um, and he does RPG stuff, and he does a lot of Traveler stuff, so I'm subscribed to him. He did a live stream, which he does, I think, once a month or so, and he probably got a few hundred dollars in contributions throughout the course of that stream. But I, I it's not something I want to deal with. It becomes a, a whole over piece of overhead where I need somebody to basically manage the thing um, while I'm talking. I would need somebody to be like a stream admin. Um, and I don't have that person right now. So let's go back here. 
back into the actual stream. Uh, that said, there's a lot of folks that stop by here every week, right? So, I mean, you know, I should probably think about um, if anybody would like to volunteer their services to be an administrator, which basically means you got to sit here and hang around and you get to be an admin, and if anybody's being a dick, you get to throw them out. That has never happened in this stream. Uh, but it would also mean that you'd like highlight specific questions so that I don't miss them in the chat, which is something I do constantly. If anybody would like to volunteer their services to do that, please contact me at ardwolfslayer, all one word, at gmail.com. So... And if you don't, I will have to uh, draft John Longshore to do it. And Wars of Marcus Aurelius looks good. Uh, Stilico looks good, too. Um, by the same designer, Robert Dulesky, I believe. Um, so, the... Uh, and I decided I was going to go with Wars of Marcus Aurelius just because it was first in the series. Uh, I have had the game for six months. Um, and you're just seeing the unboxing video this week. So that gives you some idea, some insight into the process of piling up unboxing videos until I'm ready to release them. I've still got stuff to film. I, I forgot about this, actually. We're going to have to do this this week so I can give uh, the ASL third-party stuff back to Fucko on Thursday. So... I think the tip thing, so I actually do qualify for that. You have to be a certain level of YouTube person to do that. And maybe I should. Maybe I should. So I'm, I am, um, there's a lot of variables that were, are going into our, the RPG thing. And a bunch of people have bailed, like 30 people have bailed in the last couple minutes. So I don't know why that is. You're going to miss out on all this quality RPG talk. Um, so let me talk about this. There's a couple of irons in the fire for RPGs. One of which is something that I were that was originally going to be a collaborative GM thing, but is increasingly looking like something that I will be a player in. Um, that will be a traveler thing, and I'm very much looking forward to that. And I hope that that matures into something that occurs in the next couple of weeks. That would be awesome. You will literally be the first to know about it here on this stream. So, oh, I will be the first to know about it. You will be the second to know about it on this stream. Or the third to know about it. Um, and the other thing is an RPG that I want to run. I, I am, in general, more interested in running an RPG than I am in playing an RPG. But running an RPG takes considerable effort. And there's, like, you know, it, there's an inertia factor that has to be overcome. So... What will that be? That's a great question. Um, and because the thing I'm going to be playing in is Traveler, the other thing that I want to run is not going to be Traveler. And for much of the history of this idea, um, it was going to be, you know, oh, obviously it's going to be Traveler, right? I mean, come on, what, what else am I going to do? So, I mean, I might do something with Harn. Um, that is a possibility. Har I'm aware that Har what Harn means in German, thank you very much. That's been a running joke in the Harn community for a long time. One of the other things that I'm going to eventually have to talk about is the... Um, is the uh, the weird situation that Harn is in, where it has two publishers um, who don't get along. You have Columbia Games, the original publisher, and Celestia Publications, the Iron Robin Crosby's publisher that he broke away to do. There was legal difficulties um, that I'm not sure actually ended up in court because I think nobody wanted to actually sue. That's possible, but they both claimed ownership, and they're both continue to do stuff um in recent years columbia games has has had a more consistent flow of product but Celestia has done quite a bit of stuff as well and this has worked out to be very advantageous for harn fans in that virtually everything that columbia games has done has been set on the island of harn itself with a few exceptions they've done some stuff with avinia too um and Um, Cal Calestia has done almost exclusively stuff off of Harn. So in uh, Shurkina and uh, Amel Rene and uh, Harbaugh and various other places like that. And now they're getting to Hepicaria, which is actually really neat. 
Um, but I wish they would work faster, <laughs> right? I wish Columbia would release stuff at a faster pace than they do as well. So um, I uh, am I backed up on chat here? Because welcome to the live chat. Interesting. Some something weird's happening. Okay, we have already covered the series rules topic. I think pretty exhaustively. We can always revisit topics too, and and maybe um, I always kind of wait to do the topic. Um, maybe we'll do um, an RPG centered counterclipping chat at some point, which doesn't make any sense. Maybe we'll do a mapping chat instead. I'll show you my project. Those who bailed early will not get to see. Um, this special preview <laughs> that I forgot where it is so there's that now we gotta wait for it to load because the file is enormous this is in no sense close to readiness to become an actual thing and in fact even this exact file is not close to becoming an actual thing. This is the world that I have been noodling around with for the past few years in a completely scattershot way. Um, there's no name for the planet. The name of the project is called the Villastrine Chronicles. And you can see an obvious Harn influence here, I think, as well as a, an effort to make it look somewhat like the planet Earth and, and therefore use... Um, Earth-like patterns to help define the, the setting. Um, to what extent this will turn into anything is anybody's guess. Right now, this is there's two files in the in the folder. There's this and and the Conlang file. So uh, the Conlang file is very noodly. Speaking of noodly. Because um, I have done some reasonably in-depth Conlang world. That's constructed languages where you build build the languages, which adds a lot of verisimilitude because it means that your names will make sense. Um, that is something that I notice when like reading a fantasy novel, and um, not everybody notices that kind of thing. Um, the big boxes here are the la linguistic zones, where they're not language families, they're... Uh, orthographic families, uh, orthographic regions where everybody in the Northwest region will use the same orthography to transcribe their languages into English. And I think at the moment there's four different language families in there. So, no, I actually did the math for this and, and did it by hand. Uh, it required a... Um, this is... A, a map projection that I have literally done all the calculations on by myself. I'm, I mean, I was going to say manually, but to the extent that I had Excel helping me. Um, I can probably make... Uh, I see adjustments I want to make even now. So maybe we'll do a mapping chat instead of a kind of clipping chat at some point. Um, I hope that you will all join me for that as well. We are a couple minutes over, but I still have a few sips of whiskey left, so we're going to finish that off. I have... I don't have a... I spent like a whole day last week... Um... reorganizing my Harn files, of which I have quite a few. This is the Harn, the main continent on the world of Kathira, uh, which is the uh, the world that Harn is in. And you can see Harn in the upper left-hand corner here. Um, and again, you can see that there's, there's a sort of Eurasia and Africa type of uh, influence going on with the map here. But it's an amazing map. Uh, they've never redone it, which is a curious thing. A, a new sort of version is available from Celestia, but uh, Columbia Games has never redone this. I want to say that Robin and Robin Crosby did these maps um, originally, and I—I I mean, 
I don't know, but I, I swear this looks like colored pencil to me. Um, and it's just a gorgeous map. There's so much information on these maps that um, even on the... Um, on the... What do we have here? Do I have uh, the Harn map? Hold on. Harn regional maps. So this is the Harn regional map. This is the original poster map that came in the original box. There's a there's an unboxing video. Um, so check that out for a closer look at this. And I mean, it's it's hard to overstate how much information is on here. So the the uh, you you might see that there's a couple of different textures here. There's this sort of ripply texture, which is mountains, and the dots texture, which is hills. And then there's also um, this swamp texture that's used over here and then the color indicates the vegetation that's there so when you get to the really high mountains that have snow covered peaks it's in white right um, so and you actually all the mountain peaks are marked on the map right um, well not all the mountain peaks but all the major mountain peaks are marked on the map um, you have these sites of interest which are you know presumably adventure sites Epicary is basically North Africa um, we go back here uh, here's Hepicaria. So that's basically nor if you if you picture that as being where like Tunisia and Morocco and that kind of thing is culturally, I don't know if that's a good model or not. Maybe it's not, but um, the, the, all this stuff around the Mediterranean, the the Venarian Sea in this case is inspired by historical stuff. Like the Empire of Azerian is definitely inspired by the Roman Empire, but. It's still around in the equivalent of the Middle Ages, which the Roman Empire sort of wasn't. Um, and then you have the Corregian Archipelago, which is kind of a Greek type of thing with city state, independent city-states and stuff. Um, when you also have imperial rivals to Azerian, uh, none of this material is particularly well-developed except for Harn, which has been developed exhaustively. Uh, there's a fair amount of material on Ivinia, fair amount of material on Shork... Th this is the Shorkino region right here. Um, I can show you the Shorkina map. That's this map. I'm not sure I've ever done this on, th this on video before. Um... So, uh, hilariously, there's a, a planet in the Space Master universe where it's the Role Master planet. Um, so, there's a there's a Shorkina regional module. There is no Sh Kingdom of Shorkina module, uh, but there is a Kingdom of Kelumbi module, which is this little island in the middle. Um, and the city of Kelumbi is like the biggest city on either map by a lot. So, and there's a city module for that. So if you want to do city-based adventures, it's a great place to be. But you can do that in Harn too, right? There's plenty of cities on Harn. Uh, even small medieval cities are more than big enough to accommodate campaigns. Up, uh, up here you have the kingdom of Harbal, which is an Avidian kingdom. Um, and then you have Harissia, which is kind of this wildernessy type area with one, the one town of Beldira kind of out in the middle. The trouble is that there are, in addition to these regional... I don't know if trouble's the right word. Um, in addition to these regional maps, um, you have what are called the Atlas maps. And both Columbia Games and Celestia Publications are doing these Atlas maps, and they're showing these areas in much greater detail. So, by hand, because I'm a nut, um, I have actually been taking these apart and putting them back together. This is the whole Harn map, for example, and Shorkina. Um, so the Shorkina maps are the Celestia maps, and the um, the Harn region maps are the Columbia Games maps. We're getting way lost in the weeds here. Uh, but then when you go into zoom into this, you've got every little tiny settlement. So these these all these little circles and hollow squares are all different kinds of manors and stuff like that. Kaiser Bill, thanks for stopping by. Um, what they're using for this, I couldn't even tell you. Um, no, no clue. Um, this is uh, Caldor. By the way, I'll mention... I, I should have put this on the list. Uh, the Kingdom of Caldor Kickstarter is still going if you want the Kingdom of Caldor in hardcover. Um, if not, then uh, I think Caldor occasionally gets given away for free in PDF on DriveThruRPG. Uh, it is totally worth your time. It's a fantastic fantasy kingdom. Um 
at some point we'll talk about that on video as well. All right, so we are about 10 minutes over now. I am going to have my last sips, and if anyone has anything else to add, please add it now because we're going to be going for just another couple of minutes while I close all these extra files. So I would like to say thank you for stopping by, everybody who stopped by. We topped out today at 83, which is a little lower than usual. However, we got connections going on right now, so I suspect that a lot of people um, were either tied up with some of the after-hours stuff there or um, consequently have been watching streams all day and weren't in a mood to chime in here. So I consider 83 to be a startling triumph um, at the end of the day. I have done, I did the Kickstarter on the, the hardcover. That was a proof copy that they sent me. I had to send it back to them. Um, and then I have done a walkthrough of the Caldor module. The hardcover has the Tashal module in it as well, which I have also done a walkthrough of that, talking about the, the, the background and all the permutations of the background. I could talk about Harn all, all day, to be honest. So maybe, we, maybe I just got to turn that into video. It's all, all I have to do. Um, but we'll have... Uh, I've got a fair amount of material now at this point to talk about uh, Harn stuff. Turning point simulations. I have no experience with turning point simulations. So uh, I know that they have some things that look relatively interesting. That's all I can say. Otherwise, I don't know much. All right. So I'd like to thank everybody once again for stopping by. Please join us next week uh, at 8 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time here uh, this time, this channel. Um, and we'll be doing more counterclipping stream. Also, don't forget to join me on Wednesday on this channel at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, where I will be joined by the maestro himself, Dan Pancaldi. We'll be talking about um, newbie-friendly topics. In uh, this case, it will be... Uh, Todd, thanks uh, thanks very much. You did get a shout-out earlier if you watched the video afterwards. Um, we'll be talking about Wargaming Collections, and then I've mentioned the various other videos coming out this week uh, all along, so we won't get into that. So once again, I'd like to thank everybody for stopping by. Until next time, happy gaming.